President-elect Donald Trump had a fierce meeting with the media elite. I'm going to read to you in its entirety the very short New York Post article, and I have to try and not laugh. Also, we're going to play a clip of President-elect Trump's promise to the American people about his first 100 days. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. If you don't say it, they can't use it. If you do say it, it's all they've got to use. I, besides doing this television show, uh, my name is Randall Terry, by the way, and thank you for joining me. Besides doing this program, I have had the privilege of being interviewed by every major news outlet in America and many foreign news outlets from around the world, Australia, Italy, Germany, England, Japan, because of my pro-life work and uh, some of my political work. So it's an adage in the, in when you're dealing with the media. If you don't say it, they can't quote it. And if you do say it and that's all they've got to use, well, then that's all they've got to use. So President-elect Trump, in what I consider a stroke of genius, has yet to hold a press conference. Do you realize that? He is yet to hold a press conference as the president-elect, which has the media elite enraged. And in the next segment, I'm going to read to you <laughs> the New York Post story of what went on with the media elite meeting yesterday where he took them to the woodshed, okay? But first, I want to give you the opportunity to see unfiltered what President-elect Trump sent out in a video. Was it yesterday or today that he sent it out? Okay, so yesterday, after, I beg your pardon, excuse me. Yesterday, after we had already filmed the, the last night's program, President-elect Trump sent out this video. And this is all that the media have to use. It's only two and a half minutes. So I want you to think with me for a minute. If you watch CNN, Fox, ABC, CBS, NBC last night, how many seconds of this two and a half minute video did they deign to show you? Watch this. Today I would like to provide the American people with an update on the White House transition and our policy plans for the first 100 days. Our transition team is working very smoothly, efficiently, and effectively. Truly great and talented men and women, patriots indeed, are being brought in and many will soon be a part of our government, helping us to make America great again. My agenda will be based on a simple core principle, putting America first. Whether it's producing steel, building cars, or curing disease, I want the next generation of production and innovation to happen right here on our great homeland, America, creating wealth and jobs for American workers. As part of this plan, I've asked my transition team to develop a list of executive actions we can take on day one to restore our laws and bring back our jobs. It's about time. These include the following. On trade, I am going to issue our notification of intent to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a potential disaster for our country. Instead, we will negotiate fair bilateral trade deals that bring jobs and industry back onto American shores. On energy, I will cancel job-killing restrictions on the production of American energy, including shale energy and clean coal, creating many millions of high-paying jobs. That's what we want. That's what we've been waiting for. On regulation, I will formulate a rule which says that for every one new regulation, two old regulations must be eliminated. So important. On national security, I will ask the Department of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to develop a comprehensive plan to protect America's vital infrastructure from cyber attacks and all other form of attacks. On immigration, I will direct the Department of Labor to investigate all abuses of visa programs that undercut the American worker. On ethics reform, as part of our plan to drain the swamp, we will impose a five-year ban on executive officials becoming lobbyists 
after they leave the administration, and a lifetime ban on executive officials lobbying on behalf of a foreign government. These are just a few of the steps we will take to reform Washington and rebuild our middle class. I will provide more updates in the coming days as we work together to make America great again for everyone. And I mean everyone. Is that, I mean, believe me, it doesn't say anything about babies, doesn't say anything about the Supreme Court, doesn't say anything about marriage. But withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Bye-bye. I'm done. We're leaving. Instead, we're going to have bilateral agreements. And for those of you who don't speak international uh, dialogue or political uh, foreign policy dialogue, bilateral means I'm going to cut this deal with Japan. I'm going to cut this deal with Singapore. I'm going to cut this deal with Indonesia, whoever. So he's not going to say America is going to be a part of this big thing like the North American Free Trade Act. No, not going to happen. We're going to go country by country and create deals that are fair for us, that are fair for them. They're going to put their country first. We're going to put America first. That's got to have some of the globalists coming unglued. The, the next one, the canceling restrictions on American energy, people, again, biz, ethics, the ethical crisis that we're facing, the killing of innocent babies, the shedding of blood, homosexual marriage, setting those aside for a minute. This is probably the single most important thing that will come out of our president, this president for domestic policy and foreign policy. I'm going to take a break. I'm over on a break, but I want to explain to you when we come back why that one issue of canceling restrictions, why that one issue is probably going to redefine America and redefine the world. And then I'm going to read to you the New York Post story, either in the next segment or the one after that, about how he just took the media to the woodshed. I wish, I wonder if somebody had a secret camera in the room. I wonder if the Trump people <laughs> had a little camera up in the corner. Oh my goodness. I'll be right back. Don't go away. I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. If you own a business and would like to advertise on our program, please contact us. We are currently seen on over 130 television stations from coast to coast. We air at 8 p.m. Eastern and then all times are local. We have a lot of reach, friend. And this is an opportunity at a great price for you to get your product or your service in front of hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people. Also, if there's something that's important to you and you'd like to have a month where you just say thank you to this ministry or promote a certain ministry or a certain cause, contact us. Our rates are incredibly affordable. You'd be surprised. And you, again, can reach into hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of homes. We're currently seen in possibly in over 30 million homes. So give us a call, give us an email, and we'll put a commercial up for you. Hi friend, I'm Randall Terry. This is Voice of Resistance. The second point he made, uh, President-elect Trump made, is that he was gonna cancel restrictions on American energy. Now, if you're a policy wonk, you're thinking, what does he mean? Do you understand how many restrictions there are on American energy? The coal industry. Is he just gonna roll back the regulations and say, have at it, start to mine coal again? Because it's very efficient, it's very inexpensive, there's a lot of it. What about the the pipeline. Is he gonna is he gonna open the Keystone pipeline? Fracking? He said fracking. He said we're gonna allow fracking. Fracking has produced millions of barrels of oil. Does he mean that we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna start to allow oil rigs on the coast of Florida? On the west coast, the coast of Texas? What does he mean? Does he mean that we're going to drill in Anwar? the Alaska Northern Wildlife Refuge. All we need is about 2,000 acres, people. All right, we're talking about tens of millions of acres up there. We need a little 2,000 acre footprint. 
where we drill and where we have refineries or whatever they have to do to process the oil and then begin the process of shipping it down. Now, listen to me. Some of you, like me, are old enough to remember the hubbub, the hue, and the cry over the Alaskan pipeline. Bobby Sue, that's before your time. Billy Bob is before your time. Did you even know that there was a hubbub? You ever heard of the Alaskan pipeline? In the 70s, they put in a pipeline from Alaska through Canada, and the environmentalists were freaking out. This is going to destroy the environment, and it's going to destroy the caribou. And oh my goodness, lo and behold, there actually ended up being more wildlife for two reasons. The pipe, the pipe is huge, and often it's above ground. It served as a windbreak. It served as a windbreak, and the warmth coming off of the pipe actually helped animals survive that would have otherwise died. And so they saw an increase in the wildlife that they were terrified was going to be destroyed. All right, so... <clears throat> Right now, I'm just dealing, I'm just dealing with the domestic. Inside of two to three years, if we just turn American ingenuity loose, all right? Yes, with proper regulations, we don't want oil spills. We don't, you know, we don't want our sky and our water supply polluted. I get that. Within two to three years, we could be completely, completely, 100% free of all Middle Eastern oil. Zero. If we wanted, we could be free from Canadian oil, which we probably wouldn't do. We need them as a trade partner. We could for sure be free from oil of, from our southern border. Do you understand the impact that that would have on international relations? Do you understand that we could become an oil exporter if we wanted? You understand that it would put a massive crimp in the pipeline of money to, to, or to Muslim terrorists? Now, I, I don't think, my master's degree is in international diplomacy and inter, diplomacy and international terrorism. So, you know, I was forced in, under the rigors of scholarship to study these things. The average human being in this country or in European or for Middle Eastern countries, cannot envision the difference in the world if the United States became energy independent. Completely on our own, we don't need any of what you have to offer because then think of the foreign policy leverage that gives us. We no longer have to negotiate with somebody who's got an energy gun to our head. We get to say, we're going to do what we want based upon justice, righteousness, woman's rights, human rights, not upon our need for your oil. I'll be right back. Don't go away. I'm going to read you that New York Post story about what happened with President-elect Trump and the media elite. Friend, this program is supported by friends like you who believe in what we are doing. We run a very tight ship. Thankfully, we are on over 130 stations across the country having tremendous impact. We get emails every day. We get letters in the mail. Not every day, but almost every day. We hear from people who love what we're doing. What people don't understand is that it's sort of expensive to produce a television show like this. It doesn't require earth-shattering funds, funds, but it, it does require financial help. So. I am asking you, if you enjoy this program, throw us a 10 or a $20 bill every once in a while, or even a 50 or a $100 check. You see the address there on the screen. Your gifts are not tax deductible, by the way, because we want to be able to say what we want to say regarding politics without the IRS telling us no. So if you like the program, I ask for your support. Welcome back to the program. I'm Randall Terry. We were talking off the air about the impact on the world if America was truly energy independent. And I, I actually think it's almost unimaginable. And one of the questions was, don't we have some company in Saudi Arabia that has the name Amera in it? And I'm certain that we do. Originally, the Saudi family who is in charge of Saudi Arabia 
knew that they had oil, but they didn't have the money to exploit it. So American companies went in there and got multi-decade leases. Ultimately, after the American companies made billions of dollars, they let the Saudis out of the leases and restructured the, the agreement. But you, I want you to think for a second, why so many American oil executives don't push for full energy independence. The reason is because it's a like price fixing. When the Saudis put a crimp in the amount of oil that comes from them, so it's always, not always, but mostly driven by the Saudis or OPEC as a group. When they say, we're gonna tighten the, 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 the hose a little bit, put a crimp in the hose, they shorten supply and then demand stays where it is and so it drives the price up. So I can remember just a few years ago paying $4 a gallon for gas. Okay, now we're below $2 a gallon. But the Saudis, when they tighten the spigot, American oil executives are going, yeah, baby, because all of the American oil prices shoot up. Our cost of production doesn't shoot up. Do you understand? Do you understand me? Our, our, the cost of our production does not go up. It's the profits that go up. And there have been years where ExxonMobil, they were the most lucrative, profitable businesses in America and probably in the world. And it is vulgar. It's despicable because these men are not obligated to raise the price. They can say, we're not doing it. We're not gouging the Americans, but they gouge us. Okay. So President Trump is saying, I'm putting the American worker and his family first. We're going to have total energy independence. We're not going to allow OPEC or Saudis or the Saudis to raise the price of oil by shutting down supply. We're going to have such a big supply. We'll keep gas below two dollars a gallon for the foreseeable future. Who knows how low it can go once all the infrastructure is paid for with the profits of the oil? All right, I'm going to I'm going to read to you. Let's switch gears. I'm just going to read to you. If you if you want, you could put this up on the screen just so it's not totally boring. But this is worth reading. <laughs> All right, this is from the New York Post, exclusive, the Trump transition. Donald Trump's media summit was a expletive firing squad. Donald Trump scolded media big shots during an off the record Trump Tower sit down on Monday, sources told the Post. It was like a expletive firing squad, one source said of the encounter. Trump started with CNN chief Jeff Zucker and said, I hate your network. Everyone at CNN is a liar and you should be ashamed, the source said. The meeting, quote, the meeting was a total disaster. <laughs> the TV execs and anchors went in there thinking they would be discussing the access they would get to the Trump administration. But instead, they got a Trump style dressing down, the source added. A second source confirmed the fireworks. The meeting took place in, quote, the meeting took place in a big boardroom and there were about 30 or 40 people, including the big news anchors from all the networks, the other source said. Trump kept saying, we're in a room of liars, the deceitful, dishonest media who got it all wrong. He addressed everyone in the room calling the media dishonest, deceitful, liars. He called out Jeff Zucker by name and said everyone at CNN was a liar and CNN was a network of liars, the source said. Trump didn't say NBC reporter Katie Turr by name, but talked about an NBC female correspondent who got it wrong. And then he referred to a horrible network correspondent who cried when Hillary lost, lost who'd hosted a debate, which was Martha Raddatz, who was also in the room. The stunned reporters tried to get a word in edgewise to discuss access to the Trump administration. CBS Good Morning co-host Gail King did not stand up, but asked some question. How do you propose we the media work with you? Chuck Todd asked some pretty pointed questions. David M Muir asked, how are you going to cope living in DC while your family is in New York City? It was a horrible meeting. Trump spokeswoman Kellyanne Conway told reporters the gathering went well. Excellent meetings with the top executives of the major networks, she said during a gaggle in the lobby of Trump Tower. Pretty unprecedented meeting we put together in two days. 
The meeting was off the record, meaning the participants agreed not to talk about the substance of the conversations. The hour-long session included top execs from network and cable news channels. Among the attendees were NBC's Deborah Turnus, Lester Holt, and Chuck Todd, ABC's James Goldston, George Stephanopoulos, David Muir, and Martha Raddatz, also CBS Nora O'Donnell and John Dickerson, Charlie Rose, Christopher Isham and King, Fox News, Bill Shine, Jack Abernathy, Jay Wallace, Susan Scott, MSNBC's Phil Griffin and CNN's Jeff Zucker and Aaron Burnett. <laughs> Arthur, I'm sorry for laughing people, Arthur Sulzberger, publisher of the New York Times, plans to meet with Trump Tuesday. All right. This is Trump saying, now please understand this. I, I know I'm over, I, I gotta quit, right, but listen to me. This is Trump saying, this is President-elect Trump saying, it's on people. You wanna fight? I'll fight. I'll fight you. I have 28 million Twitter followers. I can release a video, it'll go viral. I can circumvent you. We're in a media age right now, people, where Mr. Trump doesn't need to give them access if he doesn't want to, or he can pick and choose. He can sit down with Sean Hannity, who is not a part of the mainstream media, and he can have them chafing at the bit. Now there is a New York Times meeting, which is supposed to happen today, but, all right, I've got to take a break. I'm just telling you, this is Trump saying it's on. And him releasing that video that we played for you a little while ago, that's him saying, here's where we're going. And we don't care if CBS or NBC likes it, and we don't care if they complain because I'm not giving them interviews about it. This is what the American people elected me to do, and it is what I am going to do. I'll be right back. I'm Randall Terry. I want to invite you to go to our website. Almost every book that I have ever written is available as a PDF online for free. We have a ton of products, training materials, tools that are available for you for free. All we ask for is that you give us your email address. That's it, so that we can stay in touch with you and yes, from time to time, ask you to support this work. So I'm inviting you, go to the, the website. Now for those of you who say, well, I, I don't want a PDF, I want a real book. You can get one of my books. All you have to do is pay for shipping and handling and then give whatever gift you want. And if you can't afford anything, we'll send you the book for free, just pay shipping and handling. Why are we doing all this? Because we want to change the direction of the country and we need to raise up a fresh generation of warriors to do that. That's why we have this tool. I invite you, go to the website, see for yourself. Does God judge nations? If so, why? What does his judgment look like? And is America under the judgment of God? I answer these questions and many others using the scriptures in my book called The Judgment of God. I encourage you to go to our website and download your own PDF and study the scriptures on the judgment of God. Hi friend, I'm Randall Terry. Thank you for being a part of the program. One of the purposes we do this show is to equip you to be a force for righteousness, for justice, for truth. And part of that involves inoculating people to deception and to deceivers. So what I want you to think is this, it's, it's almost like some, dealing with somebody who's a, a, a drug addict. There's an adage when you're, in drug, when you're dealing with drug addicts, if their lips are moving, they're probably lying. I'm not trying to be unkind, that's actually an adage. If their lips are moving, they're probably lying. It's not always true, but if you've dealt with drug addicts, you understand. If you see George Stephanopoulos of ABC and his lips are moving, he's probably lying. Wolf Blitzer, if his lips are moving, he's probably lying. I know it sounds unfair, but what I'm saying is this, they are not intelligent and they are not honest, they are articulate. Do you think that Satan, when he dealt with Adam and Eve, or Eve in the garden, do you think 
that he was honest? No. But was he articulate? Yes. Was he convincing? Yes. Paul wrote that the devil would change himself to look like an angel of light to deceive the elect if possible. Just remember that when you're dealing with the national media. They are not intelligent. They are not wise. They are articulate and they are deceptive and they are dangerous. Talk to you tomorrow.